happens, the work session. I don't remember. There it is. There we go. I call to order this Grand Haven City uh, Council special work session. And Linda, would you call the roll, please? Vanessa? Here. Bruger? Here. Scott is excused. Fritz? Here. And Michaela? Here. We have several items on our work session agenda this evening. And if I flip the page, I'll get to the first one. We'll have our presentation by our uh, Historic Conservation District Commission, the review of the recommendation of proposed designs for the Grand Trunk Depot. So. Yes, we're excited to be here. Um, I'm Marcia Peterson, and I'm chair of the Historic Conservation District Commission. And we're happy to be here because we're going to report out after a lot of research that we've done on those three proposals. And we've learned a lot more about the depot and are even prouder of its existence. So I hope that by the time we go through it, um, you'll understand our recommendation and endorse it fully as well as so many other people have. First of all, when we look at the Grand Trunk Railroad, we, uh, we know that it architecturally it's very significant. It was built in 1870, and it's Italianate, which so many other buildings in Grand Haven are. And you can see that by this um, semicircular arched windows, the regularly spaced brick pilasters, and then the large decorative brackets that support and are overhanging the eaves and many pa photos have been taken there if you notice from the earliest time to most recent and this actually was an active depot and it continued working until 1955 for freight and or for passengers and in 1967 it discontinued its freight so the city of Grand Haven wanted to do something with its waterfront so they managed to get a grant from the Laudit Foundation for 50,000 and then they put in the remaining 16,000 and some change. And their goal was to demolish it. And then Dr. David Siebel, who um, put an ad in the paper, and he said, what do you think about this, folks? If you're against it, fill out this little slip and send it in. And because of the huge response, overwhelming community response to saving it, um, the depot and the city council decided that it should remain. And then it ended up being, in 1971, the Tri-Cities Historical Society Museum. And after that, the museum put in 10,000 and untold hours of work to bring it up to snuff and use it as a museum. And in as recently as 2017, after 45 years of good stewardship by the museum, the Tri-Cities Historical Museum handed it back to the city. But before they did that, we had a transitioning meeting where the director of the museum, the, um, the board, the staff met with the city council. And we talked about various ways that this could be used. But one of the things that we all agreed upon was the historic, historic significance of this building. And we agreed that we would keep that exterior as it was. That was the goal. And you can see a letter attesting to that fact that you already received as council members. The other thing that this depot has received is a lot of recognition. As early as 1972, Grand Haven recognized it, and the same year, so was it put on the Michigan Register of Historic Sites. And then, as recently as September of 2016, the National Park Service Department included it on the de um, depot in the National Register of Historic Places. No small accomplishment, by the way. It had to reach many rigid standards, and then because of those standards, there are some rigid ways that it should be preserved. So the Secretary of the Interior's standards for re rehabilitation is that a property should be used for its historic purpose. Not, not gonna happen. But if it's not gonna happen that way, then what else can we do? Well, we require, this, this uh, interior standards requires that minimum changes be made to it and that the historic properties should be maintained. And as I just discussed about the um, Italianate architecture, those are some of the things that add and make this a beautiful building. So distinctive features and finishes should also be minim minimally impacted. And 
in cooperation with this, and it's kind of astounding and a, and a nice compliment to the city of Grand Haven that we do have a downtown development association. And so they too put out what recommendations they had because we've lost an awful lot of historic buildings in the downtown area. And so we're trying to save them. And so the qualities that should be maintained, again, are simply stated. When we look at the depot and we see those doors, the, the, the guidelines are don't change them. If they need to be replaced, replace them with wooden ones and make them original. Do everything as m well as you can to keep its original look. And we go on to the windows, it's the same deal. Don't enlarge them, don't make them smaller, keep the sashes. Now if you need to do thermal panes, do it, but do it in the style of the architecture. So when we give our recommendations, it was with a lot of research. We were studying the museum, or, or the depot, it used to be the museum. Um, we went several times inside and looked at it and thought about it. We also did research with a variety of the library and the museum too, and looking at the Main Street uh, DDA design guidelines. So what we have recommended is that we continue the preservation of this 1869 70 railroad depot at One Harbor Road, and that we do none of the currently proposed changes to be made to this exterior. We keep it as is and we maintain it as architecturally intact as we can. So we look at those proposed changes for those three architectural drawings, and this is what we came out with after really studying it and touring it, is that we did not believe that there would be significant light if the, one of the proposals was to extend the windows down another two feet. But rather, it would be a disadvantage because you'd be seeing cement and foot traffic. And the ideas came through, we'll paint it a lighter color put in some different lighting, and it will still lighten that space without ruining the inside. Now, if you've been in that depot, it's kind of like standing here in the middle of the council that both sides have beautiful symmetry. They have a look there that when you see it, you look through the back, you look through the front, and it's the same arch windows. And we would hate to lose that by changing anything. And also, if you see that picture, the new stadium, getting rid of those um, bleachers has opened that up and it's a beautiful site and actually this adds to it, the view from the waterfront. We also looked at the seven existing doors, they're all ADA compliant, and the number and placement of them accommodates a variety of interior design changes. And current building codes do not require any changes to the current size of the doors or windows in order to move forward with the proposed use of the building. We also know what's nice is um, with these preservation groups is they <coughs> show you ways you can preserve things. You, wood is now the new energy efficient one and that you can often duplicate things in a very historic way without going through huge expense. So that is our recommendation as well. So the economic impact um, we know that if we were to change the historic and aesthetic value by, ch by doing these changes, that we really have gained very little because it exists well for a variety of uses right now. And also, if we change it, the historic preservation grants will no longer be available to us because it, we will be not following the code for that. And historically, if you think about who's put the money in and who's put the time in this building, and it's been the community. And so again, we owe it to the community to do something that they would approve of. And so, uh, the final proposal here is in accordance with the Main Street DDA design guidelines and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, the historic Conservation District Commission advocates the continued preservation of the 1869-70 DNM Railroad at One North Harbor with none of the current proposed changes to be made to the exterior of the nationally recognized important contributing structure to the city of Grand Haven. And what's been fun about this project, I have to say, it's been a pain because we're rallying to save it because we really believe it's an integral part of the waterfront, it anchors it. But the uh, MDAA and the 
uh, Tri-Cities Museum, we all work together and we're all strongly in favor, in favor of this preservation. So would the Historic Commission stand up a minute because they've all worked very hard on this. And I um, want you to know that this is our recommendation and we're very pleased with the work we've done and we hope that you can appreciate it and follow our recommendation. So thank you. All right, thanks very much. So um, Kristen, or Kristen, is, is there, did you want to, okay, I didn't know if you were, you don't have to, I just thought I'd ask. Um, because I, I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is that um, to make the fullest and best use of this building, uh, what would you recommend then? If you don't, you know, let's not change anything. Are you talking to me? Or sure. Yeah, no, I'm talking to you. Yep. At Marsha at this oh, point. Okay. Well, yeah. I guess one or has your, has your committee, we have to go back up the microphone. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. We, we talked about things actually the museum too, when we were brainstorming on how to use it. And I guess it depends on what the city and how they want to use it. But um, one of the things that I thought was particularly insightful was one of the members of the Historic Commission said, we want it to be a place that people can go into. I mean, you know, we see the depot on Jackson and it's beautiful, but only if you're a dental client do you get to see the inside. And we'd like the depot to be used and whether that means leasing it to another organization for them to redo it is one, one question that should be answered. And I know the city has some, what, some um, reservations about being a rental unit and making it into something. We hate to see you spend a lot of money redoing the interior when you aren't even sure where your money's going to be made or who's going to be in it, that you might solicit other people to do what uses that may come out of that. So that was one suggestion that I thought was good. Did I answer your question? Not fully. Okay, what's the other part that I Well, I, you know, I, I guess what I, you know, if we're, I, and I am, I'm just curious as to, you know, what other things that you may have, because uh, it, something's got to be done. So, and to, you know, if you're going to have a, one entity in there, as it's going to be, they're going to be deciding what, what to do with it. Well, as long as so. the guidelines are the, ex, that the exterior stays the same. And so what to do with it is if we were to do any, if we were to put money in it, it would be to, we, and that was one line I probably missed there, is to do it on the, it's a 150 year old structure, so it needs a lot of work. So do those things that re-solidify it using the wood, using the brick that's there, or very, in fact, Kristen, didn't you say that you could get brick that some, somewhat was similar if we needed it? Yeah. Okay, but to design it, and make it a, uh, um, a significant structure of today, but using that historic view. Replace all those doors, but they're beautiful doors, and keep the same format. So okay. does my historic commission want to say anything here about use or anything? Well, I think covering the building up, which was something Kristen talked about, you know, from the basement up, uh, Cindy, you want to get come up to the mic. You, you got to come up to the microphone. You know, it, it, without us knowing what is it going to be a brewery? Is it going to be a convention stop? None of us know that. Mm -hmm. What we do know is it's a significant building. You talk into the microphone; they can't hear you on the radio. Oh, though. sorry. <laughs> um, it's a significant building, so the outside should stay the way it is. The inside, there's a, 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 a huge amount, depending on the usage. But we do know that we have to do some things with the foundation and the basement. There are some things that we can start doing to get it ready for whoever might want to lease the building. Okay. I mean, we just don't know. You don't know. Right. No, I just it. wanted to know. However, I, the significance and the right. grant monies are not going to come anywhere near this building if it gets changed. And we do have a beautiful building. So we can work with the outside yeah. as is and, and work from within. All right, well that was kind of what I wanted to know. If you didn't want to do any any, any changes, what, what did you have in mind? So There's um, so many opportunities to do on the inside. I actually agree that the outside should maintain the, the character of the building and that 
it's part of the history of our Grand Haven as it is. You know, we were one of the number one spot, you know, for the trains that come in and out of here. And uh, boats would be lining up out into the outside our harbor to get in here to get loaded. I mean, that's how busy it was here at one time. To change the character of the outside of the building would be detrimental to the rest of the city of Grand Haven. We need to maintain that. I have to agree with you guys 100% on that. But the inside, there's so many opportunities to go where we need to go and the inside. Uh, I can't see why, you know, that doing the windows, uh, I'm sure you have to go with thermal panes because those are definitely heat losses that, but we can keep the character and keep everything the same. It's very easy to uh, get architectural windows that match them pretty easily now. I've seen, uh, seen a lot of them because I was looking at them for my house and my house is old and I want to keep the same type. I have what they call barn windows in mine <laughs> and they definitely don't keep no heat, but there's windows out there that are thermal pane and stuff in that order for me to put in there. It would be saying to keep my house looking the same. So I'm, I'm up to looking, making, looking the inside, but maintaining the outside the way it is. I have to agree with them. Well, when we had our joint meeting with the council and the museum board, and we talked about potential uses, we talked about things such as a portion of it leased to a permanent occupant, a portion of it left open for public space, and there was lots of ways to slice and dice those ideas. Not, not a single one of them was dependent on exterior changes to the building. All of them could be accommodated with interior changes and even not drastic changes, but for some partitioning, some uh, redecorating, but you wouldn't have to drastically change that, but not a single one of those proposals was dependent upon exterior building changes. And we were pretty clear about the importance of the building at that time, and I remember it pretty clearly because I was on both council and museum board during that meeting. So it was a very important thing to me. I also would like to comment that in your in your um, presentation, you talk about the museum putting $10,000 and many hours of labor into that building. The museum put well over $100,000 in that building. That was the first year. Okay. As, as time went on, the, 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 the muse, museum put a great deal of money in that, and it was really a labor of love for many years. And, and so it's, it's been well taken care of. It's also important to note that in 1870, when the, when the uh, railway station was on the other side of the river, the people of Grand Haven bonded themselves to build the bridge to get the railroad on this side of the river because it came across the north side. So the community has been investing in this, this facility and the economy behind it, the, and the, uh, the utility behind it, basically for 140 years. So this, this goes way back. I think, to, I think it's really an important nod to the community that we preserve what we've got and we respect what we've got, make, make good use of it, but not alter it more than we have. Can I, um, what I'm hearing, I think, if I could clarify, is don't do anything with the outside. Except to maintain its integrity. We put in the doors and doors and windows. But follow the regulations to change the outside. <coughs> well, okay. They're going to have to do probably new doors, but they do wood doors that would be manufactured to exactly like other shafts. Okay. And then the inside. We can go ahead and gut it if we want to. Well, there are some things that you might want to say, but we're more on the outside. Okay. So okay. Yeah. No, and I, I, there's a lot of, I, I work on a lot of older homes and really appreciate preserving as much of, we, of what is there as we can while making it functional for, in my case, a family today. Um, I struggle a little bit with the don't do anything from a developer standpoint, although I'm not one with a whole lot of money <laughs> or any really. But if we were to tell a developer, hey, um, we want to lease this building to you, but sorry, you can't do anything with it. You have to work with what's there. We're going to take our potential pool of developers from about 100 down to maybe five. And then going to tie a few strings around their wrists and say you can and can't do certain things. And I'm, I'm not saying that I necessarily, I, I don't disagree. I think there's a lot of great things about the building, but I just am a little worried about just saying, no, nothing can be done. 
No, well, well we're saying the integrity of the outside must be maintained, yeah. and, it, and it's some things must be done. The wood, the wooden doors and sure. windows need to be replaced, and you want better looking glass there, yeah. as Mike was saying. But as far as the inside, in fact, I, you know, as as a com as a commission and as a council, you might think, okay, what are the purposes? And if somebody's going to bid it, at least if the outside and the integrity of the building is there, they can design the inside at their cost. Okay. I mean, we know there aren't enough electrical outlets. We know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, so we know those things, but I did not say don't do a thing because okay. it's in disrepair. Sure. Okay, that's where I want to clarify. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. But don't, but don't just upgrade what is outside, what is visible from the outside as far as the doors and windows. I've heard that, if possible, or uh, we really want wooden doors and wooden windows. Is that what I'm hearing? With the same design. Same design and everything those, else. Yeah. Those windows yeah. and doors are oh, they're cool. charming. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, and that's where I'd be putting my money. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, Marcia. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And if anybody else wants to talk, I'll, my little group here, we get a whole selection of people. Go ahead, Randy. Come on up. <laughs> Me. MDAA. Okay. Randy. Hi there, Marcia. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Randy Smith, and I'm the chair of the Preservation in Place Committee in Grand Haven, a part of Main Street. And uh, we're very interested in maintaining the character of the downtown and the historical buildings. And uh, we came up with the guidelines, which are based on the Secretary of the Interior guidelines, which are in the back two pages, 21 and 22. But that's just the beginning of it. They will go into great detail on how to restore an old building like that depot we aren't the first people in the country that have ever done that. Um, the post office building in uh, Washington, D.C. was taken over by Trump to turn into a hotel. And I just read the other day that they replaced, they restored 1,100 windows and replaced them and put them back in. So if they can figure that out and how to use it, I think we can figure out how to use our depot, which we all love and uh, need here. So. I just wanted to, I won't ramble on too much, but. Be the Grand Trunk there. Depot instead of the Grand Trunk Depot? Don't be afraid of the <laughs> guidelines. It's just yeah. that they're, they're, not, they're not helping. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I hate to be the bad man out. Actually, I don't mind it at all. But um, because we have this great new stadium and we have this uh, great depot building, which has a tremendous amount of historic significance. To Grand Haven, but it's not, you know, I, I don't see it as sacred ground. Uh, and if we can utilize it, you know, better than what it's being utilized now, I don't know if wooden doors are the, are the best fit. Uh, and I, you know, so to say, well, if we make longer windows, uh, the only thing you're going to see is concrete, I, you know, I, I just could take issue with that because more glass means more light. And, uh, and if you you know it's, you see out you know, there's you see anything that goes by so I I don't you know I'm not totally sold on the the let's not change anything or let's make it let's keep it just exactly the way it was 150 years ago uh, I'm not sure that fits with you know what what how it would complement our our beautiful new stadium and so I I think I'd be open to a little bit more uh, the front of the building the the south end of the building uh, can can be uh, as historic as as it is, but the back that faces the uh, the stadium, I would I would be open to to more changes than uh, than what the recommendation is, and I don't you know I don't mind saying that, and so I just did. So because uh, I I'd like to be a little bit more flexible than that. So uh, there's some things that that are worth. Uh, you know, you want to preserve. I, I can look at, you know, we can have some people say, well, we can't take down the Sims uh, uh, steam stack because uh, that's part of our history. How old is that? That's, you know, we'd still have the Story and Clark stack if it hadn't been knocked down by a, by a storm. So uh, mm -hmm. and look at the Story and Clark building. They put all kinds of, you know, there's changes made there. There's a lot of st stuff was restored and kept just like the West Wind building uh, a ton of stuff has been, uh, historical part of that has been kept, 
but it's also been upgraded and, and uh, it's a beautiful addition to our city. So I guess I wouldn't limit it uh, quite, quite that much. So that's my feelings on it. I don't, Pat, if you have any observations or, or thoughts while we're... Well, I'm, I'm naturally thinking about next steps, you know, where we go from here uh, after tonight. Uh, we've got an architect who's engaged to, to work with us to come up with some cost estimates of, you know, ideas of what things need to be done with the building. The museum took great care of the building, but it is a very old building that we're looking at potentially different types of uses than what it was before, uh, which might mean some structural investment, some mechanical investment. Uh, it's likely to be a, a significant undertaking. Um, there, there may be historic preservation grants available. I'm not aware of them at this time. Uh, we've not gotten them in the past for this building or other city buildings, but um, perhaps there's something out there. I'm, I'm <coughs> not privy to them right now, but uh, we would like to get a cost estimate together and an idea of the direction we're going in. I don't know that we're going to get a particular user who's going to come in and uh, want to invest six figures when we're going to let them lease a third of the space. I don't think we're going to get a developer to come in unless we're willing to completely let go of control of the building and let a developer come in and, and do something different with the building. But so far, city council's pushed us in a direction that it's going to be primarily public use and public space with maybe a, a smaller component of uh, some other space that would help pay the bills, you know, utilities and such. But uh, uh, so I, I just kind of need to get, you know, you looked at four drawings. Uh, Tonight's the first time I've heard that the recommendation is none of those options. What the, the DDA voted on, and I just reread the motion, um, and I, it was, they were very explicit. They went over the motion several times, is, uh, you know, minimal impact was their, their statement. They didn't say they didn't like any of the options. They just said, you know, keep the impact as minimal as possible. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just looking for what the majority of city council wants us to do. Uh, and if that's no change, some change, you know, I, it's going to be hard for us to get there uh, without some clear direction from city council. I, I, I'm not sure how I would write the resolution. I don't know if any of you have any ideas of how I would put something in front of city council to, to move this forward. Well, I, you know, oh. I don't want to leave you out there on your own, Jerry, and, and my questioning wasn't um, of what your uh, opinion was on what we should do because I entirely agreed with it just trying to gain some understanding. Um, I'm hoping that there's some middle ground somewhere um, where we can find some reasonable way to use the building. That's going to bring more people into it. That's going to showcase it for the community, that it's going to be an asset as a part of not necessarily just our history, but of our present day activities. And I'm concerned that if we say blanket no, as far as the exterior goes, that leaves no middle ground whatsoever for finding a consensus on what to do with it. Um, so that, that concerns me. I don't, I don't want to be in that position. I don't want to put a developer or any potential uses in that position. I think there are ways to pay homage to the past. There are ways to preserve, let's say, 95% of the exterior. Um, but saying that 100% of it, aside from some upgrades, has to be, a, has to be the deal. Um, that makes me very nervous uh, about the potential for the future of the depot. I don't want it to gather dust and just sit there uh, as it has for the last few years um, and as it would have the potential to do into the future. So I, I didn't want you to be out on your own on that, Jerry. I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle, I would say. Well, we, could, we could move forward with the architectural demands for the inside of the building and the structural and the HVAC without dealing with the windows, just you know, leave them as, are, as they are for now. Um, and just get it so that it's in a state that we can go ahead and get it occupied. Um, and that's going to be a significant undertaking you know, without doing anything with, with any of the exterior. I don't think myself personally, Josh, that uh, the going on the outside, leaving it as it is, is going to be detrimental at all. I don't really think that that is because there's a lot of old buildings around that people have done and made them look just like they did back in 1870. But when you walk inside, it's like you're a wow factor walking in. It's just going from one time period to a new time period and if you go around you'll see that all over the place where they maintain it that way mm -hmm. and I and being with the character of the downtown and everything that we have you'd want to maintain that integrity we have you know showing that I don't think we need to modernize the outside but if we want to go to the inside I have to agree with Pat that we need to get 
structurally wise, you know, and what everything else we have to do on the inside, making sure that if we can get an attendant in there right now, who's going to want to invest into it when we don't have all that done taken care of ahead of time? We need to at least get it so it can be occupied on a full time basis by somebody if somebody would be interested in it. Well, and I think that there's people out there who would be glad to occupy a building that look like this because it is such a um, piece of grain even character. There's considerable freedom and ability to do things on the interior, the space they're actually occupying. And I, I, I don't believe that anyone's going to find the outside to be a detriment who's going to say that this is a bad thing. And the fact that you, the idea that you need to make noticeable changes to the outside to make the building something you can occupy just doesn't make sense. So no, I don't, I don't go there. And I, and I do recall this, the joint meeting we had when we talked about the uses. None of this was dependent on making a lot of changes to the outside or bringing any attempt to bring more light from the outside in or longer windows that reach the ground, which in fact would not give you any more view unless you're laying down. So it's, uh, no, I think that you, I think that there will be people, developers that can be found, not developers, but occupants who can be found who would be glad to occupy that building and respect the appearance of it. So I'm not, I'm not concerned as Josh is that you're, going, you're not going to find anyone. You may not find somebody who will invest millions of dollars in it. Well, we're not really looking for those people either. We're looking for somebody who will keep this building alive, make it usable to the people, and occupy it, and maybe sweep the floor. But not, not totally gut the building and change it into something that it wasn't. So I'm not nearly as concerned about that. As far as fixing things that are broke, yeah, you do that. Maintaining things that need to be maintained, you have to do that. So but those don't require that you alter the building in a significant way. They require that you fix the things that need to be fixed. The foundation, limestone foundation, has been degrading for some time. Yeah, there's problems there. The museum found that too when they were in it. Um, the roof is assumed a shape of age, which actually gives it a lot of character as well. Doesn't mean it, mean it has to be torn off and replaced, although I'm still, it creates on me that we took the new addition and lined up the roof lines and they don't line up because they, they should have been offset. Now we have a big copper scar on the top of the building. We could have been a little more respected to the building when we put the addition on as well. I just hate to see us do more of that to the building. So, no, I think that we can uh, occupy the building, find somebody who's glad to be in it, do changes to the interior, maintenance to the exterior, and still have our depot. Well, you know, if I can have my second opinion, uh, for all, we're, we're looking out on the Grand River and we're going to look at it through postage stamp size windows. We're going to take that, that fantastic view and we're going to cut it into little pieces. And I think that's a shame. So, you know, the, the yes, the historic integrity of the uh, of the building may be uh, changed somewhat, but uh, I would say it's worth it to get some more light in there, to enhance the view, to make it more marketable for somebody that wants to have uh, wants to whatever do want to do business in there, or the city wants to do business in there, and. Uh, and be able to see what you can see outside of those outside of that building, which is which is an amazing panorama of the longest river in Michigan. And and I I just it, it was that was what struck me when I'm standing in there looking out the window of one of the, the the small windows that I had to crane over to see to be able to see what was out there, instead of having being able to have a great vision of the beauty that we have here on our waterfront. And I just find that a shame to say, you can't change anything. You can't even put a glass door in there. It has to stay a wooden door with a small window so to inhibit views. And I just, that's, uh, I think it's there to be used. I think it's there to be occupied. I think it's there to be busy. And in order to do that, uh, I hate to go against the grain uh, but actually, I don't. I don't know why I even say that because I think the ultimate and best use of this building is to open it up for a tremendous view of, like, say, the longest river in Michigan that we happen to sit 
on the on the mouth of as it flows into one of the Great Lakes, and I just uh, it's a historic building. But I, you know, when they built it originally, was that, you know, the, did they say, well, you're never going to change this forever and ever and ever? I would hope not. So. So actually, it's amazing what a lighter coat of paint can do to the place. And I think that there is a lot of nice light that comes into those windows. I think it's a wonderful creative opportunity for Could a developer. Could you tell Linda who you are? I'm Jane Stilfker. Oh, okay. And, and I'm on the Historic uh, Commission. Yes. Um, and I think about the, the possibilities of the interior that when I think of like a Faneuil Hall in Boston, that could still be a really bustling market. It could be a place for the public and all they want it, they can go in, they can explore it and feel it and the lightness and get in, take into that energy that was once there um, when it was used uh, as the depot and then go outside and see the beautiful lake. You don't have to stay indoors and look out the window. Go outside and enjoy the brand new uh, venue that we have. I just think that um, if y y to be mindful of that integrity of what it was and what it can still be, using that outside, I don't think it's going to affect um, what goes on inside at all. The inside is, can be a life of its own, but keeping the outside, because once it's gone, as we know, it's gone. So, thanks. You're quite welcome. Well, Pat, do we know, uh, you feeling any better about? I am directed, I am zeroed in, <laughs> I know exactly what to do. Uh, I will talk to Kirsten, I think we're gonna come up with some, we've got more than enough work to set forward on without dealing with the parts that all we're right. not exactly uh, all on the same page on. Uh, so I think we focus on what we all agree we should be doing, foundation, roof, floor, HVAC, uh, interior treatments, working with the uh, Historic Commission as well, give them some, some role in continuing to keep an eye on that. You know, they've, they've indicated an interest and uh, I think we can work, make work of that over this winter um, and get some plans together to, to move forward with that. And then if, uh, I, I we have a room full of historic preservation interests tonight. Um, the, the other approach to this thing is that buildings do change, times do change. What the stadium is today is not at all what was there and we didn't want what was there. Um, so the fact that there could be change is, is natural, but it doesn't sound like today there, there's a strong majority feeling that we want to make any changes to the exterior appearance of that building. Um, but I, I imagine they had different ideals when they were using it as a train station to get in out of the elements and make office space in there and and now it's going to be used differently um, and, and perhaps some future use might change the attitude on that but I think for now we focus on the things we everybody seems to agree on which is let's put some TLC into the building to make sure it stays right where it is as an historic building so there's little tweaks around the edges and a brick comes out we got to put a new one in we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. But for now, I think we got enough to work on. I hope we can move forward positively and get some plans together and some estimates. And I, I believe we can make everybody happy. All right, sounds good. Rare days. Let's do what oh, we I can. Think, You're absolutely right. I think you can, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely finessed. All right, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you for your input. Absolutely. Yeah, you got to say thank you to the Historical Commission for coming up with a, at least a recommendation. Thank you for the thoroughness and your passion. No, I do. I, do. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Our next item on our work session is, uh, oops, we'll just wait for everybody to. Thursday at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Thanks, Marcia. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marcia. So, Derek is here to tell us about our PESA ratings. Good evening, Your Honor. 
Council. Uh, yes, uh, it was a few months ago that we were talking about um, road uh, treatments and resurfacing and can we get a better plan um, for those, uh, where they're going to be and uh, what year they're going to be in and uh, if we were to magically have this bag of cash flow down from the state or the feds, uh, how would we do that? <clears throat> and so um, I told you this winter we we're going to do um, reevaluation of the, of the uh, roads that uh, we're going to plan on resurfacing. Um, the Blue Ribbon Committee did it last 2013. However, we use a software for asset management for our roads. It's been around since 1992. I'm not the city has used it since then, but we do have all of our roads inventoried and their conditions um, are surveyed every two to three years. Um, they're, they're surveyed by uh, certified PACER rating experts. Um, and I'm not uh, one of those at the moment, but I do understand the dynamic and uh, it takes a while to get those certifications. Um, so we have, uh, Wimsor Dick um, uh, does the, the PACER ratings, but how do we, how do we take those and what do they mean and um, how we best use our, uh, our funds um, and this information. So Abba Marsh, um, I talked to them about it and if they had any uh, ideas on how um, other communities have done it um, and they said, hey, we've got someone who's really good um, with that software, uh, Roadsoft. Um, and uh, give us access to it and uh, we'll see what we can come up with. So they came up with the attached report that I gave you um, and I'm just going to highlight uh, some of that. Um, so what they did was is they took our overall ratings for every road and categorized them as 1 to 10. Um, 1 and 2 meaning it probably should be re reconstructed. Um, 3 through 7 or 3 through 6 should be resurfaced and 7 through nine, uh, typically new roads, they might need some treatment um, where 10 is being reconstructed. So we had one last year that was a 10, that was Grand Avenue, phase two. We're gonna have one road this year that's gonna be a 10, that's two blocks of Harbor Drive. And uh, so we don't get too many 10s, but the idea is that, you know, how they deteriorate over time uh, and they get the, the ratings uh, will follow those. And they don't always, uh, a road doesn't always just deteriorate at the same rate either. Um, so anyways, with the ratings, we took their, Abbott Marsh took those, um, and then how do you, how do you figure out um, where the biggest bang for your buck is? We've got utilities underground we need to re, uh, replace. Um, so do you wait on something to, um, to reconstruct it later on um, while you use utilities, do you resurface it now? All those questions that we've just stumbled over. But some of the, uh, the treatment costs um, and treatment techniques we have to make some assumptions on. And so they did that with uh, current um, costs for um, road, res uh, road um, treatments. And it's outlined there on the second sheet. Mm -hmm. um, so we can do a couple things. We can crack seal, which we do that. We have that in our annual budget. Um, it's about $2 per, per, per lane mile or $2,000 per lane mile. Um, it's preventative keeps the road surface um, from uh, seeing the infiltration of, of water or uh, snow and ice. Um, they have a cape seal on here or uh, microsurface over a chip seal. It's not a technique we've used in the city. It's a, usually a lot of counties use that. Um, however, it's, uh, it's effective to put a new uh, driving surface on it, um, $37,000 per lane mile. And um, then what typically what we do here in the city and most, most cities do is do a mill and overlay. Um, it's considered a rehab rehabilitation, about $175,000 per, per road mile. Um, and then of course the full reconstruct is about $450,000 per, per mile. Now that's just the road. We're not talking about utilities, um, curb and gutter. Um, <coughs> as you're aware of the costs that we're spending on Harbor Drive, <coughs> all the utilities, curb and gutter, um, $1.8 million. That's traffic signal as well. Um, but it's, it's still, it's really expensive. Um, but these are the assumptions we had to make in order to put that into the formula, or Avon Marsh did anyways. Um, so what do we want to <coughs> do? We want to make our PACER ratings uh, go up on an average, and how do we do that? Um, and what is the cost to see that impact? So the uh, Roadsoft actually has these modules built within it. 
and there really isn't anybody here at the city that um, is fully trained on that RoadSoft software. It's, it's very intricate, but there's experts at Marsh engineers that do that for all the communities. So they, that's why it was a free <laughs> and, and be quickly for them to, um, to, to get this information. So, but what the, the information came out was, hey, how do we, uh, if we put in, uh, I had to put a baseline in, uh, they asked me what that was. They said, well, currently we're, we're doing about $500,000 worth of preventative maintenance annually. That's uh, 450,000 resurfacing and another 50,000 in track ceiling, both from major and, and local roads combined. It's about half a million dollars. Um, we don't spend all that some years, depending on, on what kind of bid uh, prices we get. Um, last year we got really good bids on, on our track ceiling, so we didn't spend all 50. Um, but uh, so we, we had to put a baseline, where, where we're starting with. And so that's where the half million dollars came from. Um, and then from there, um, the formula, the algorithm uh, that they use says, how do these elevate? Uh, at what point uh, does dollars over ratings elevate? Um, and with, with this, so this is to elevate the rating. This was a um, million dollars a year is what we need to put into our, into our road system to keep it the same. Um, the second uh, analysis was remaining service life. So this is like how long is that going to uh, that road going to last? Um, as you can see, at the current five hundred thousand dollars, the blue line there at the bottom, uh, road life goes nothing but downhill uh, from here. Uh, we're just not putting enough in. Um, at seven hundred fifty thousand or even a million dollars, um, it's really not. Uh, it starts to flat line. So one point two five million dollars is what. Um, if we want to raise the average uh, remaining service life of the road. So these aren't, um, these aren't uh, catch-all figures, they're generic, it's an algorithm that, uh, that we need to uh, take into consideration. But it, what it does is it tells us that we don't have, we're not putting the money into our roads, and everybody knows that. But what the number is, what the goal is, just to keep it level, um, kind of gives us a, a shot in the dark. Now, um, further along this winter, I'm going to take those numbers or whatever numbers that, uh, that the council may deem uh, uh, available for funding um, to, uh, to see where those dollars would actually be placed uh, in a, in a uh, resurfacing plan. But just want to show you that, uh, that currently, as you know, we're, we're not putting enough. And it gives you kind of a dollar amount to shoot for. Um, it's a big dollar amount, uh, and I don't know where the money is going to come from, but um, we definitely uh, have, a, have a target to, to shoot for. Um. <laughs> Derek, I'm just laughing because you're essentially telling us we need to do double what we're doing. <laughs> you're doing it with a very casual deadpan presentation. You're doing a great just, job. Uh, just to stay even. Yep. This isn't even to, to, even. Uh, to increase uh, um, our ratings. So, yeah. Now, now, there are years that we do, um, like Grand Avenue um, or North Shore Drive, you know, we are putting more in, in the road system than, than a half million dollars. That's just the preventative maintenance. So, you know, um, the million dollars or 1.4 million we're going to put into North Shore next year, 1.8 million dollars we put into uh, Harbor Drive. I mean, we are making an impact, but just to maintain the basic level of maintenance and resurfacing and, uh, and condition, you know, we do do more so not that you didn't know that already um <laughs> but we have some numbers here and that's that was the greatest thing about about this was you know it gives us a target you know what really should we do and otherwise i you know as staff we can we can list all the roads that need to be resurfaced that's for sure um but uh but on the long-term plane you know um this uh this chart goes out to um 2026 so 10 years you get to see kind of the impact of, of the investment um, and the, the, the uh, slope of what that investment uh, creates. So, I mean, we could do, if you give me one and a half million dollars, we'll make, we'll make this city even better. So, um, but the other things that, that can change that we wanna make sure you understand is, you know, that uh, the marking conditions um, and costs associated with these upgrades, um, you know, were assumed. So they're gonna, they're gonna increase uh, throughout the, that 10 year period. Um, and we're already seeing that um, with the predictions this winter uh, with one of the um, North Shore Drive and uh, some other projects that we're going to be bidding 
uh, like the fluke of field that, you know, steel tariffs, um, labor markets, you know, they're all being really impacted um, for the projects that we're going to have going <coughs> forward. Well, when you talk about these specific projects such, such as Harbor Drive or North Shore Road or Grand Avenue, you elevate a road to a pacer of 10, you're talking about relatively few miles of road, so you don't really move that needle much. Because we're really talking here is the average across the community. And so, I mean, these graphs are the ultimate kick the can down the road type of, of a graph. You see that even though we pour money in, it continues to decline unless you put in a lot of money. So I appreciate that. The other thing that Denny Scott and I attended the last policy, commi policy committee meeting of Windsor Dick, and there was considerable talk around the table about the quality of roads, the uh, desire of the incoming governor to fix the roads right with the right materials and so on and so forth, all the campaign rhetoric. And the question was raised, well, how come we aren't doing that anyway? And the MDOT official there was relatively blunt about the need to fix a lot of different roads as best we can. And so one of the comments of one of the other committee members was that we get the best roads at our price range. And putting it bluntly, we're willing to build an inferior road so we can build lots of them, or at least maintain lots of them, because otherwise you get a few really good roads and all the rest of them just deteriorate. And that's that's what we're up against here. And where is this money going to come from? I don't know. We can't we can't um, we can't raise that much money on an everyday or an every year basis. We can't even raise our water and sewer rates enough to take care of those systems. So raising more money for doubling our investment in our roads is going to be a big challenge. <clears throat> I think that moving the needle up on the pay average pacer rating is probably not going to happen. You're going to probably try to maintain it where it is and catch the low-hanging fruit, fix the worst roads, and the others will gradually find their way to the center of the rating. I wish I had a better answer, but unfortunately it all costs a lot of money. As they say, we're getting the best roads in our price range. There's some there's some truth to that, that uh, some of our infrastructure was um, designed to last 50 years, and that's what we paid for. And when it ends up lasting 35, we don't get that dollar uh, value out of it. Um, however, when we when we build something for 25 and we get 20 out of it, um, we busted that, uh, you know, that road surface or that, that um, bridge or highway um, more bang for the buck. So I'm not uh, not saying that's what we need to do here, but eventually we got to do something. So. One thing that I, I want to add um, that's not in the report, you know, talking about funding, um, the state has um, uh, promised increased funding with uh, um, sales tax and increased uh, registration fees. And so the prediction um, starting in 2017 was that by 2022 or 23, um, we would be seeing an increase of almost 50%. We get just shy of a million dollars. It was about 900,000 two years ago when I first got here. Um, we're just shy of a million dollars, and they're saying that's going to climb up towards 1.4 million. So the um, outgoing governor and, and legislature um, has committed additional funds, and that's going to be significant uh, for us. So we will be, hopefully, um, that, that'll come to fruition. We'll see some more. But as you can see, even that's not enough to raise our roads and, you know, and keep them or even maintain them at the same level. So, I uh, I appreciate everything you guys do down there because I know when I first came on, they w weren't doing any crack ceiling at all, pretty much. And uh, the ex-mayor, when he was down there, we made sure that we got crack ceiling and, and got that going, which actually extends the life of our roads. And I, I applaud uh, our DPW by taking a good look at our roads <coughs> all the time and making sure that we have fairly decent roads and if you're not our council members here also point out to you which ones they think need to be done also I know it's gonna be difficult for us to come up with that kind of cash to go and to keep investing but by doing the crack ceiling that we've been doing and maintaining all the potholes and stuff like that and having our see click fix and I tell you that works that people call in and it does actually take care of it, it maintains our a road that you can at least drive on uh, you go to in other towns and you'll see where it, they don't have that ability to do that as much as we have been doing and their roads are absolutely the pits. Um, I, I don't, we don't have that kind of cash flow all the time and it would be nice if the state would give us 
the money that was due to us. Uh, as Mr. Bonamy, our finance director, was telling us that we had the money that, that should be coming to us instead of going to the state's pet peeve projects that they have and coming getting it back to the communities, the communities themselves would not be in the situation they are in today. So, as I said before, Derek, I said I really appreciate all your hard work and uh, the, the Cape Seal, no, that's not going to work in the city of Green Haven. Our, I don't need to have guys sitting down there sucking out our drains, getting the stones all out of it. I took that asset management class. I went down to Detroit and took a class on that with all the county commissioners and the people from the road commissions, and they were all down there. It was very interesting to see how you maintain roads and how you fix them. And we're on the right path. We're doing it right by the, the cracked ceiling and the milling and stuff on that order and that. So I, we do what we can do with what we have. And I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's difficult to maintain the integrity up there we want, but we do a very good job at what we do here. I'll pass it along for sure. <laughs> Pat, I think, um, and I'm looking kind of back toward Jim, a great next step for me, at least from a visual aid, would be to take that, let's say, million dollars or whatever number it is, um, and put it in a pie chart and set to show the different wedges of the pie and where the funding currently comes from, what we already have coming in as far as our annual budget goes, bonds that we have out there, what we can maybe anticipate from the state, just so that we can start to plan ahead a little bit. This is great information. The next step is to try to chart out where the revenue comes from to be able to do this, sure. if, if we so decide to actually keep up with our roads. Well, as luck would have it, the very next presentation on the work session is from Jim to talk about infrastructure funding. Do you have a pie chart, Jim? <laughs> he can make a pie chart. He's You're got really excited. <laughs> you know, there is, it's a limited amount of money. There's a limited amount of money you can take out of people's pockets in order to pay for things because they still have to take care of themselves. So we, I think we do a great job with what we have. And I will continue to do a great job with what we have. We have some real burdens that have weighed us down. Uh, but I think we, you know, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on that, on some of those things, where it's going to break some uh, money free over the next few years that I think we're going to, but, and it's, we just do what we can. And I think hopefully people understand we got a lot of, you know, heavy traffic that comes on our roads and tears things up. And some some organizations help pay for that, and and, and others don't. And uh, so, but we do our best. I think we're doing we're way ahead of a lot of other communities because we're doing our you know our complete infrastructure work. And I think we've done a great job of leveraging the money that we have with grant money that's available, and with money that comes from the state. You know, no, they're not giving us what they should in revenue sharing, but I think we do a great job of of uh, grant writing and leveraging the money we have in order to get uh, to get uh, more money back than, than we might if it wasn't for our ability to uh, to go after these dollars that are available. So, you know, it's, I, I think everybody's kind of in the same boat. And, uh, but I think we're doing a real good job with, with what we're doing. It's, it's a shame to see, but it, you know, we live in a four, four season climate and that doesn't help. So uh, we got to we we deal, you know. You got to play the hand you're dealt, and I think that we're doing a decent job at what we're doing. And I appreciate your efforts, and the efforts of our crews, and uh, it's a tough job. So good good analysis. Appreciate it. Thank you. And at this point, um, rather than entering into, we're going to save Jim for. Uh, for when we continue the work session uh, after the start of the council meeting. Just a second. All right. So at this point, maybe we want to open the doors and, and uh, adjourn our work session. And we'll wait a minute for Josh to come back, and then we'll start our council meeting. Hey, Roger. I have it. We wanted them I have mine. So <laughs> What, what, what resolution? Oh, I got that.
All right, we are ready to start our Grand Haven City Council meeting. And uh, Linda, would you call the roll, please? Vanessa? Here. Ruger? Here. Scott is excused. Fritz? Here. And Michaela? Here. Our invocation this evening will be given by Reverend John Kodiker. And please remain standing after the prayer for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful city in which we live. We thank you for all the opportunities we have for work and leisure time. We thank you for those who have been called to these positions to um, continue good things in our community. We pray that you will bless and care for each one. We're thankful for our citizens. We're thankful for our nation. And as we think today of... Uh, uh, George H.W. Bush's passing, Lord, we have such a great country and, a, and uh, so much to be thankful for. And we pray your blessing upon all that is done here this evening, and in, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, We have um, one new appointment and one reappointment on our agenda this morning. Thanks, Pastor. And uh, so, if Linda, if you want to, you want to do them. Yeah, you know, we, we need to do them separately, well, right? I'm reading them together. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. This is to appoint Rich Dawkins to the Parks and Recreation Board with a term ending June 30th, 2022, and to reappoint Nicolette, Nicolette Neese to the Parks and Recreation Board with a term ending June 30th, 2023. All right, is there a motion? So moved. Support. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, we can go ahead and vote. Vanessa? Yes. Berger? Yes. Fritz? Yes. Michaela? Yes. And Rich is here, so I can swear him in. Uh, do you want to just come up to the microphone? And Linda will meet you there. I, Rich Dawkins, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of the Parks and Recreation Board in and for the City of Grand Haven, County of Ottawa, and State of Michigan according to the best of my ability. I do. All right, next on the agenda is a uh, presentation. Well, first of all, I want to say, you know, we, we have uh, a lot of boards and committees. Sorry, Roger, I, I got to put a plug in for, <laughs> uh, we appreciate all our board and commission members and, uh, and we're, we have, I have several are still in the audience uh, today, or a lot of them were here for the Historic Commission, and I see several here from Human Relations and DDA. We just appreciate all the folks that Give other volunteer time of our, you know, our city, and always be on the lookout to see whether there are vacancies. If anybody's interested in serving on one of our boards, uh, you're always there's, you're always welcome to uh, give your time. We appreciate we appreciate everybody that. Besides, we we put on a great dinner in the spring for all those volunteers. So uh, there's that that perk for you. So um, anyway, at this point, you know, I ask our Commissioner Roger Bergman to come up and make a presentation on, uh, well, he'll let him explain it. Okay, there you Roger go, Roger. Bergman, 214 <laughs> Washington. No, it was interesting at the um, work session, listening to uh, your, your gentleman from Avon Marsh talk about your roads. And uh, I've learned a lot, you know, in the 20 years that I've been in government about roads and how important they are to maintain and, and the cost and how do you balance all that so appreciate it. 
you all have to consider um, because you can only kick the can down the road so long. Eventually, just like our forefathers uh, had to fork out big bucks to pay for the roads originally, um, you know, at some point in time, somebody's going to have to fork out more dollars to pay for the roads. So, anyway, I wish you well in that <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, but I'm here tonight to talk about a long range um, goal of this city, this community. When I say this community, I'm talking about Northwest out of a county, but also the whole county. Um, and when I say long range, I'm, I'm hopeful that it might happen in my lifetime. But um, what we're trying to do with this resolution is trying to encourage MDOT to set aside money to actually um, pursue the, the rest of M231, finishing the project. And to do this before some of the uh, property to the south of this, um, where this uh, new road would be, the interchange of 196 and where 231 should be, um, there's a possibility that there may be some development that might be coming uh, in the foreseeable future and uh, what we're trying to do is encourage not to at least try to find a way to stop that from happening or or at least look at um, time when they might be able to start purchasing property so that's what this is about and I have been working with um, not just Windsor Dick, West Michigan Shoreline Regional Development Commission. So I, you know, you, I can say Windsor Dick, but most people don't know what that is. That's <laughs> West Michigan Shoreline Regional Development Corporation. That's the MPO that um, is part of Northwest Ottawa County, Grand Haven, Spring Lake, and, but it also <coughs> includes Muskegon. And Ottawa County has three MPOs. The only county in the state of Michigan has more than one MPO. We have three. The second one is the Grand Valley Metro Council, and that's Hudsonville, um, Jenison, uh, Georgetown, and then also Grand Rapids and all of those areas. And then the third one is Macatow Area Coordinating Council, and that's Holland Zealand area. And all those those other two have done a resolution similar to this to encourage MDOT to proceed with um, two th excuse me, 231 phase two. And now our um, MPO has done the same thing. And you have a copy of that. And uh, Bob was uh, at our meeting last week and was quite supportive of this. So, and uh, Denny was also, so appreciate their support on our MPO and the work that they do. Um, have any questions? No, I, uh, I think that uh, having seen how busy uh, 231, the bypass is becoming, I, I, just, I just think it's, it's imperative that it's finished all the way to Holland. So uh, I, I fully support this myself just to get it, uh, get it moving. I'm all about it. I have to agree. Um, as before, we discussed the 231 and, and the completion of it. First of all, fact is they want to widen ours and turn it into what six lane or six lanes and whatever else, and take away our median and make our town not so quaint as what it is. I would rather see them finish this and and see what the results would do before they end up destroying our town any more than what they've already done by dividing it with a, with a highway through it. The challenge is that what Bob heard last week too was from the gentleman from, from MDOT was that you know they don't, they don't have enough money to, to repair the roads that are existing let alone create new roads. Yeah. That's, that's the big challenge. So we're asking them to create a new road, and um, that that is a big challenge. To do but, 
But the point of this resolution isn't necessarily to build that road, but to preserve that route. And that's what, that's what the hazard is here. The longer this lingers, the more development will occur along the proposed route. And this is somewhat, somewhat carefully worded and um, almost wish it had been slightly more direct, but I understand the wording. Mm -hmm. But the real point of this is that we want the uh, MDOT to look carefully at this route, what's becoming of it, and what it might cost in the future if we don't exert some level of control over the proposed route or identify another route that it could be. We've got a lot invested in the FJ1 proposal and the route that was proposed for that, and it's a logical route. So we really need to have MDOT go to the next step, look at the actual land there, decide how we can make sure that this route is still feasible at some future time. That's the point of this. And I really appreciated that Windsor Dick is almost entirely Muskegon, mostly Muskegon County, also, I believe, Oceana and New Waco County included? Uh, is it, nope, or is it County, or, um, Muskegon County. Muskegon, okay. But you're right, they have no skin in the game. And they, and they literally don't have a lot of skin in the game, as you say, and yet they're very supportive. They've been supportive of us in preserving our boulevard. They've been uh, supportive of us in the M231 project. And it's because they see that this is also good for the whole region. And so I think that's a message that MDOT needs to get. Even if we can't afford to build this road, we need to make it possible to build this road someday. So I think that's the point of this resolution. We supported it unanimously at the policy committee and very much appreciated our, our northern neighbors supporting us. Thank you. All right, thank you, Roger. So we are to the uh, approval of the regular and consent agendas. Are there any changes? Mr. Chairman, I wanted to remove the item uh, on the easement for Michigan Gas Utilities uh, under new business item E, uh, waiting for some further feedback from the city attorney and uh, uh, would just like to put that off to the next meeting, uh, okay. December 17th. All right, anything else? Anybody up here want to make a suggestion? If not, I'll ask for a motion to accept the agenda with that one deleted item. So moved. Motion. All right, it's been moved and seconded. And uh, we can vote on the agenda. Kruger? Yes. Frick? Yes. Manesca? Yes. McCaleb? Yes. All right. So general business call the audience. This is one of two opportunities that uh, anybody want to address council. Just come on up to the microphone and let us know who you are and where you live and let us know what you're thinking. I'm Horace Curry. How are you guys all doing? We're doing well. How about you, Horace? I think I've talked to each of you individually before. But I'm doing good. Thank you. Good. Okay. So what I'm here for is I wanted to talk about the Grand Haven Musical Fountain and also the Waterfront Stadium. We all know it's a beautiful location. People come from all over to visit it. Uh, we know it was built in 1962, updated and upgraded in 1980, also in 2006, upgraded again in 2017. And so the Waterfront Stadium was also upgraded uh, recently also. So we're always looking to make things better here in Grand Haven. It's a beautiful city. That's what we like, that's what we want. We want people to come and visit. Well, um, one thing I've noticed um, is even though people come here, it's an amazing spectacle. Um, I went, I've been in Grand Haven for 20 years now. I go to, I have a couple of businesses on, one on Chinook Pier, one at the beach. So yep. I'm throughout that area all the time. And I, I have family that come and friends that want to see the musical fountain. Um, this was during uh, Coast Guard. We were watching the boy band group. It was kind of cool. And um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm sitting in the crowd. I'm watching the boy band perform. Right behind us, there's a family. And one of the kids says to the mom, I'm thirsty. I want something to drink. And then the other kid was like, me too. I already knew the answer. <laughs> there's nothing there. Unless that little caboose is there, there's nothing there to drink. So basically someone will have to go 
to the pier, hopefully to my pizza, but they'd have to walk <laughs> or, or, or run and, and go get the kids drinks or go across the busy street at that time, wait for the light, run across. Um, I just think that's not that doable for us as being in Grand Haven. We should be doing better for people visiting. And so um, also I was thinking, even if someone older or disabled, they shouldn't have to go somewhere to get a drink of water or a, a snack. It should be available right there. And so since we do have that concession area there, I'm presenting once again, let's use it. Um, I know from before, I, I, I fainted before. I was one of those people that I was very thirsty. It was the Buick Open when it used to be in uh, Grand Blank. I didn't have anything to drink. I passed out, woke up. My parents were hysterical. I don't want anything to happen like that in Grand Haven where someone's like, I want something to drink or I'm really hungry, mom and dad. Can I have something to eat? Oh no, there's nothing here. I was reading on TripAdvisor some of the reviews and a couple of the reviews were saying, you have to bring a snack, you have to bring a drink. Why should you have to do that if you're going to watch an event, a venue, something that you're trying to enjoy, you should be able to get it right there. And that's my presentation. All right, well, we appreciate your input. <laughs> you're welcome. Any questions or do I get to? No, oh, we're just. This is just your. You know, we're listening to the ideas you you con that you've presented to us. Okay. And uh, so we we'll take that under advisement and uh, appreciate your input. Thank you very much. All right. Have Thank a great you, evening. You too. <laughs> appreciate it. Anyone else? Hi, Barbara. Um, in regards to the depot. Um, two months ago, the October City Council meeting, Council requested the Historic Commission to investigate and come up with recommendations about the exterior of the depot. And they presented that. Um, many of us were beaming with pride when we heard we are federally, state, locally, and then Main Street and also place and preservation um, acknowledges the integrity of this building. But also tonight was asked something that most of us were not prepared to think about, and that was, what do we do about the inside? And that question, in my recollection, was not brought up two months ago. So I think this community, mayor, council, could come up with some fantastic ideas. All we have to do is throw that out, let them weigh in, and any place that Carl and I have enjoyed going to, historic buildings are a very hot item. Take a look at Grand Rapids, um, Saugatuck, South Haven, um, great things are happening. And I know that is the depot is a public building, but however its future is going to end up, as it was mentioned tonight, the bracing it, prepping it where it needed, that has to be done first, of course. But allow the community to weigh in on what's best for the inside if you welcome that uh, feedback. Um, but to learn about all of our prestigious uh, recognition and to perhaps say, mm, I don't know, I think we need to look at that again. And those of us who aren't sure about the building and the exterior, maybe we could all meet there. I'd be glad to bring Horn bread and coffee, <laughs> have us stand in the middle of that building, uh, which a number of us in this room have been in many times, and notice all the light and coming into the building, and again, with proper lighting, will even make the inside better yet. And it's not as if that building is the only viewpoint one has of the Grand River. We are blessed with an incredible expanse basically starting at US 31, 
grab the boardwalk and suddenly you're hitting the coal tipple, the fish station, the engine, the depot. This is the gateway to Grand Haven. Then let's go on to the chamber building, the beautiful boardwalk, government pond, and just recently it was mentioned about the lighthouse perhaps becoming a museum. Well, we've got something awesome that's going to happen. And I do think and hope that council will be open to all the ideas that come forth. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Helen Lystra. Um, I <clears throat> didn't think I would ever be in this position again, but I fought hard to keep historic preservation prominent in this city for a long time, and I thought I was done, but evidently I'm not. I heard Mike Fritz say tonight that the highway might destroy the character of our town, destroying any of the historic buildings could do the same thing. Think long and hard before you make any changes to that building and think long and hard about what it can be used for because there's a lot that can happen there. That's all I've got to say tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. My name's Kathy McNally and I live at 100 Franklin Avenue um, and I want to uh, add my support to the comments regarding uh, preservation of the existing exterior, what's left of the exterior of the depot building. Um, I was career Coast Guard. I've been in a lot of ports. Um, I get that a steamship office is a really wonderful part of the fabric of our community. And just that depot is iconic. Um, it's part of the beauty of our waterfront. And I just want to go on record as saying I'd be very careful of any additional changes to its exterior. Uh, and I'd be also careful about um, and wise about uh, the uses you put its interior to. I spent my life in federal service and I was in a position where um, I often was in a small town where we had government facilities and I was careful about not trying to compete against private business with subsidized government uh, facilities. And so I, I guess what I'm uh, proposing to you today is, is try to maintain the historicity of that building um, and at the same time try to be fair as our government leaders about what uses you use it for. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? That we will um, move on with the continuation of our work session. I will ask Jim to come up and talk to us about finances. Jim Bonnaby, finance director. About a year ago, my favorite city manager and I were sitting in his office and he was saying, Jim, show me the future. <laughs> Well, okay, uh, that's what I'm hired to do. So we started on a plan over a course of a year, and fortunately, City Council, you've humored me a number of times talking about various parts of this process. And I thought to myself, we're almost at the point to say we almost have a plan. Now, I want to say that the numbers are not going to be very happy, other than the fact that they are, they are what they are. But the numbers are not what's important. What is important is the plan. And so when we started thinking this through, we started looking at the water and sewer rates. We started looking at infrastructure financing. We might have found an, an interesting way to boost our uh, infrastructure uh, purchases over the next couple of years because we're coming to the end of a, a TIF item. And you know, how do we combine all this together? Well, I did a couple of graphics because for me, seeing a picture is a lot easier than it is to uh, try and put a whole bunch of numbers up there for you. 
So this first picture shows the water and sewer funds and the first half of it, where it's a little bumpy, those are the actual numbers that we're looking at spending for water and sewer um, uh, capital improvements up to about 2029. <coughs> After that, that's just flat. The reason that it, it's flat is because I'm not sure where we're really going there, and that's 10 years out, and I don't think I'm going to be around to make that happen or, or see what's happening there. I can only guess. But what this graph does is it gives you an idea of the variability of the various projects we have. If we go to the next slide, you're going to see the same graph, but you're going to see the first part of it uh, truncated a little bit, and you got one flat line, and then you got another flat line. The reason I did this particular graph is that it takes the same dollar amounts from uh, 2019 to 2029, and it breaks it in two parts. The first part being what we anticipate the largest cost is going to be in that first five years, and then the second part being what we think the largest cost is going to be in the, in the next five years, and we tried to show those out. Basically, what this says is that we are looking at increasing costs on a continuing basis in order to just maintain what we currently have. We're not looking at major expansions of water lines or sewer lines. We are just replacing the infrastructure that's there, knowing that it needs to be done. The council was generous in working out a, a way to put three, three years of rate adjustments <coughs> forward to say, okay, let's start this plan, let's see where it's going to go. Thank you for that. That gave me the basis to start on saying, what is the real plan? The numbers from this particular, uh, or in this particular area, comes from the water and sewer rate study that Plan, uh, Prine and Newhoff did uh, for us earlier in the year. So, okay, that's kind of where we are right now. My hope is that over the next 10 years, as those water and sewer rates are going to have to increase to handle <coughs> the capital side, I also hope that we will be able to, at the end of that time, be able to say, okay, now it looks like we have a consistent amount of revenue to be able to maintain water and sewer rate, uh, maintain the water and sewer rates flat, and yet be able to continue uh, doing infrastructure projects into the future. That's why that's set up that way. It is a dream, I guarantee you. I have a dream, but I don't think mine's <laughs> as uh, vibrant as Dr. King's. I've heard is. that somewhere, that phrase. <laughs> but you know, you, you quote the good ones. At any rate, this is where we are at this point. The, the, the comment that's also important here is that I'm looking at a plan. I'm looking at a, a, con, a, a cohesive understanding of where we're going to have to go, what we're trying to do, and how we're trying to make that happen. And mine is merely the finance side. We've got a whole bunch of other stuff that uh, Derek just talked about earlier. We know that there's going to be some basis for getting more money in and also sometimes that we're not going to be able to get grants and such. But at least this is a start. If we go to the next graphic, we start talking about infrastructure. And <coughs> what's really kind of interesting here, and unfortunately on the screen you can't see it very much, but uh, in the paper, on paper you see that where that, those two red uh, lines meet, you see that it goes actually straight across. That's your three middle window of opportunity. And now what we're looking at for infrastructure uh, support in the future, going forward consistently, what we're looking at is saying, we've got an average of three mills a year that we need in order to handle the current infrastructure items. That, that we see today. And so you're going to have a question that you want to deal with. On the one hand, the two blue uh, bars there indicate uh, millage that is already in place to pay for bonds that have gone out in 2008 and 2015. Those will then, of course, sunset at a certain time and you see where they cut off. But the graphic, when, when you look at it on paper, the, the third part actually shows a line going straight across from where the two red uh, bars meet, goes straight across over and down to the end. That's really what you're going to need for an ongoing 
infrastructure plan for the city of Grand Haven. And the reason I say that is that we have looked at all of the numbers. We're trying to figure out what we've got. We know that every seven years you're going to need to go out for another uh, bond millage or you're going to have to come up with some way to proceed. There's really two options. One, every seven years go out for another bond millage as one of those bonds drops off, put another one in place and carry forward the next few. But I hate to say this because I am a finance guy, you're going to be paying the bankers. Why do you want to pay the bankers? What you really want to do is to get the big bang for your buck. And so my suggestion is that the other alternative is for us to look at a three mil levy during which time for the future, that's in perpetuity, which will then allow us to specifically point those three mills to infrastructure needs, primarily streets, and uh, that's really what I'm looking for is to, to fund the streets. Water and sewer, yes, but I'm hoping that the money that we get from the water and sewer rates will be able to cover their needs. Now what's also, you, you really unfortunately can't see up there is that where the pink uh, bar is, that's the uh, millage that you're currently charging for the uh, grand landing process. Remember we had a concern in 2011 and, and forward since then that we were going to come to a certain time where we knew we weren't going to be able to afford to pay the support needed for <coughs> that bond. So we started with a 0.75 mills per year to the, to the public to be able to resolve that problem, to make sure that we had enough cash in hand to make that work. Well, that's going to go away. And so when you, when you can really see it in, in, in the graphic on the paper, you can see that that line just carries straight across. So there actually is a reduction in the millage that we're going to be charging the public if indeed we do ask for that three mills. Okay, have I confused you yet? Mm -hmm. I'm about to. <laughs> Let's go a little farther. Something that's really rather interesting is that back in 97 we created a, uh, a brownfield. Uh, and the brownfield process helped us at, at the time. The thing that I was saying to myself all the time is I don't have any money for this. How are we gonna do this? And the goal was is that we assumed that with the investments that the uh, uh, people would make on property, that the increased taxes on that property would pay for those investments. Reasonably so. Almost every brownfield in the state is under underwater. They don't have. They don't generate enough revenue to be able to pay off their debts, and they are supported by general fund and other revenues. Ours is the very same case. What this graphic though shows is that this is an investment that the public made in the brownfield and said, no, we don't want to let our, our bonds go to, to go default. We want to continue to pay those bonds. But what we're going to do is that we're going to put these monies in reserve until we actually need to use them to pay the bonds. And as it turns out, the council was very prescient in 2011, smarter than me, and I asked for one mil, but council said, nope, 0.75, we'll figure it out from there. And it looks like all the indicators show that we will have enough money to pay off those bonds without digging much more deeply into these numbers at that last year. We're looking at another two years of about $800,000 a year that we need for paying those bonds, but we're getting there. Well, what's interesting is that the Brownfield law, as I understand it, indicates that <clears throat> you may go forward with a brownfield or with a brownfield TIF if you have an out, a bona fide loan that's out there that's been agreed to, and we do. Uh, Mr. McGinnis and I talked it over with the attorneys a number of years back, and we asked the DDA and the brownfield board to pass resolutions indicating that any monies that are generated from general fund monies to pay their debt which the TIF and the Brownfield, they actually own the debt. The city is supporting it because we don't want them to go to default. But any money that goes to those, we want to get paid back. Those are, those are dollars that belong to our general fund. They are do dollars that belong to our citizenry. 
So now you see a bunch of bars that show uh, they're green rather than the red. The red was the increasing cost on an annual basis. It gets to a point at the top of about $7.1 million, including not only the debt, or not only the uh, millage that has gone out there, but also interest charges at 3% per year on the money that we've charged since 20, 2011 to bring that up to about a $7 million amount. Well, that means we've got debt that needs to be reimbursed of 7.1 million at 3% interest, which starts in 2023 because that's the year those bonds are paid off the year before. So in, in fiscal 2023, we get our first return of money from the TIF to the general fund, somewhere between 620 and I'm thinking $800,000 in one year. Well, you look at each of those years going farther out, you see there's more money that's being charged off and eventually we do get down to a year where we have actually reimbursed the, the city for its help to pay, those, to pay that debt down. The last five bars, which are in blue, are uh, an ability through the brownfield laws to create what's called a local site remediation fund, a uh, re revolving fund. And what that's intended to do is to provide local dollars for supporting brownfield initiatives, such as uh, if an individual is thinking they wanna buy a property, but they don't have the money to do a background environmental. That's what those dollars are for. You are actually getting some of those dollars today because we have paid off the boat storage bond uh, two years ago. And so now you've got $100,000 a year coming in that's taxes that are coming in and those are being used to support the Grand Landing Bond because you can use those dollars for brownfield purpose and paying off a brownfield debt is a brownfield purpose. What this then shows, if we go to the next slide, is that, wow, there's a whole bunch of money that's there over coming years. Now the purple part on, on the left side there is the money that is coming in from the uh, boat storage site. I wanted to, to have some kind of an indicator there that we're already seeing some benefit from the brownfields that we had not seen before. But what we do see is that about $800,000 a year is gonna come in for a number of years to pay that reimbursement to the, the city's general fund. It's my thought that you have a window of opportunity here of using those dollars for infrastructure that you may not be able to afford right away, but this helps push off that date that you, that you start to worry about other ways of build, buying infrastructure. This gives you a golden opportunity to make some real investment within the community as you're trying to do. So then we go to the last graphic. Let's put them all together and see what we have. It's pretty. <laughs> I like pretty. Um, here you go. It, it looks confusing for a minute, but it really isn't. You see the, the bottom two bars are the water and sewer lines. The next three blue bars are the infrastructure, assuming the infrastructure totals about three mils consistently forward from about uh, 2024 forward. And then you have the closing of the, uh, the red or the dark red community center and the lighter red, the Grand Landing uh, support bond. And you have the addition of the uh, uh, money coming back from infrastructure. So you've got a plan and you've got a way to make some of these things happen. Is there a little pain? Yes, there's going to be a little pain. I don't know of any uh, time in history where costs don't go up, if not annually, at least regularly. And so that is, that is a reality that I, I hate to bring forward, but it is there. But if we can look at it and manage, manage it based on some of the potentials that we do have, uh, I would say the council did some really good planning back when we were worried about uh, putting the Grand Landing project together. And although we've had to hold the belt uh, tight for a while in order to cover those debts, we now have an opportunity to say, now we have a return that we can use for these infrastructure projects. So you have a plan. 
Will it work? Will it turn out to be this way? Have I got this nailed and it's, it's all going to work this way? Well, no, because counsel tends to make some decisions on occasion which are different from what I might know about. So <laughs> that's okay, you keep doing that, that's your job. <laughs> but that's the point, is that now we do have, I see a plan, which is your light at the end of the tunnel, and I see the tunnel not being very long, especially with those, the ability to use those dollars from the brownfields to support your infrastructure needs. <clears throat> so, what is actually going to occur? What is the plan? Water and sewer rates for operations and capital projects will probably continue to increase annually through at least 2029. And then after that, I don't know. I just can't figure out how to forecast that. I see, I see a total of three mills needed on an annual basis for infrastructure projects and that's just to maintain i'm not i I'm, i would love to tell derek that yeah we're going to be able to make those graphs of uh, our our improvements go up i'll be surprised if we can make them go up but i know we can make them flat and if we can make them flat at least we're getting as much done as we can and we are seeing those improvements last longer so that's that's one of the keys to that whole thing and the grand landing reimbursement is really a, a big saving for you for a number of years, about a $7 million that's going to come in over time that you'll be able to put into infrastructure projects. Okay, there are other things that we might need to consider and I have those on the last page and I'll just list them quickly. There's retirement fund, uh, pension funding, there's other post-employment benefits, there's operational increases, there's future union contract negotiations. Uh, debt service loan from the general fund to DDA, is that gonna turn out to be like what the graphic has shown or not? Uh, I don't know. Those are out there, and those are things that will have to be dealt with. Uh, a city income tax and special assessments at this point, city council has decided we don't wanna go there. So we're not going in those directions. You have a plan. You have a possibility, and I think that's really all I want to say. Uh, I can answer any questions you want, but the numbers, I want to reiterate, the numbers are not important right now. The plan is what is important. <clears throat> you know, the, as, I'm, as you're talking, what I'm thinking about is, you know, we're talking about Grand Landing. And, and I remember, I don't know, was it, you know, the, the years ago, when it was dilapidated uh, road commission property and dilapidated industrial property, and there was a, you know there was a vision. Now that that the 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 great vision you know hasn't come to pass, but the 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 vision that we've and it and and that's for various reasons and one of those is a you know an economic downturn that nobody predicted, uh, but. I, you know, I see what's there now compared to what was there before, and it is a, it is a, a huge improvement. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the environmental issues, you know, that we were facing or have been taken care of. There is, it's not, you know, it's not what we, what we thought we were going to see, but it's way better than what it was. And I think, you know, it's, uh, you take a chance on stuff, and sometimes it works out better than what you expected. Sometimes it doesn't work out quite as good, but it is better than what was there. And as we've, as, as uh, together we've managed this and with your guidance, Jim, I, you know, I, I think you've done an amazing job, these, you know, sticking at this to, to make it work. Uh, you know, where we're, where we're going with this, that it is gonna finally, it is gonna start paying, paying us back. And that's just a couple of years down the road. I mean, there is light at the end of that Grand Landing Tunnel. And uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's just to be able to see the end of this when we were in it, you know, some of its darkest days is a real, uh, it's a real, I, I see it as a, as a bright future, you know, for this to have that much money come loose, you know, for use, you know, for the, in the, in the community. In, in a few short years and start having it pay us back, uh, I think is a, you know, is, is, a, is a very good thing. So, uh, 
it's not exactly what you were talking about, but you know, as a as a residual of of decisions that were made in the past, and some people liked them, and some people didn't, and it didn't work out exactly the way we had planned. But I think that uh, that together, as uh, between administration and council, I think I think we've made a made the best of it. So, and I I appreciate that. And and as we look to the future, as if we can use those three mills, and but we but but our, our taxes stay relatively flat, all those things always go up, but it, we can repurpose two of those mills into, into this as permanent infrastructure fix that we, we're not paying the, the huge financing costs where everything is, you know, 50% of everything goes to just pay financing. Um, I think going, looking at this into the future is a way better way to uh, go forward. And I, you know, I hope that I hope that folks can, at home can understand uh, the way that, the way that this is going to work, and we'll see that this is a good way forward. And uh, and I appreciate I appreciate your efforts and uh, and you know everybody coming together to try to make this happen. So I appreciate your presentation and your hard work. Yes, Pat. The trick is going to be to take all of this detail and all of the wonderful evenings you've had learning about all this stuff, condense it into about a 30 second meaningful message that people are willing to, you know, that that's what we're going to be working on in the coming months. Uh, goal setting last week, city council talked about moving forward with this approach. Um, and if that is the way we come out, that that's what we'll be spending our winter on is coming up with a, a concise message that people can digest. I all due respect people aren't willing to sit through, unless they're the people in this room. Thank you for sitting through that. Uh, <laughs> so tell about 20 people about this in 30 seconds. But we really need to get that out for people to appreciate. Right. Um, you know, what Bob was talking about, this kick the can down the road, this futility that we feel when we see those road funding scenarios. We think you can never do it. Well, Jim's telling us we, we can do it. We just have to set our minds to it and, and work to get that. And that's gonna be difficult, but we'll, We'll push that and get it done. I think we've got some exciting ideas about how to do that. Well, I think the important thing for us is to realize and, and keep in mind that these upcoming costs and deterioration of utilities and the need to replace and upgrade is predictable, not hard to predict. We've been hearing it for years. And we have a plan, and it may be a longer term plan or maybe a plan for minimal return or minimal results, but. We have to have the discipline as a council and as a community to stick to a plan because otherwise that light at the end of the tunnel is going to become an oncoming freight train and we don't want to be run over by it. So it's important for us to keep in mind that this is serious stuff and that we really do have to address it. And having the millage, having some form of me some mechanism for financing, for paying for it is absolutely imperative. Uh, we, we can't take our eye off that. Appreciate what you've done here. And I think that it's incumbent upon us as custodians of the city that we take this seriously and that we follow through. And if this, this plan, if this plan gets adjusted up, down, sideways, we still have to do something and we have to do it uh, in a manner which doesn't just simply kick the can down the road. We saw the PACER ratings earlier. We saw the path we're on is a downward trend of PACER ratings. We have to increase our investment considerably just to be even and yet we think that we're doing a fine job. Well, we're doing a job. We just have to keep in mind that it isn't always what we want to hear. It isn't always what we wish we were doing. But we have to do something. We have to take this seriously, and we have to follow through. So I appreciate everything you've put in front of us. I understand how seriously you take this, and so do I. Jim, in the last uh, two bond proposals that we had that we've got passed and that what was just a ballpark figure of the cost that we had to associated before we even got the money that we had to, for the bonding and also the interest we had to pay on it? And <coughs> when you go out for a bond, you're usually at the seven million to, to 9.4 million range, which were those two bonds. You're probably looking at $90,000 in just cost to get the bond done. Then you start looking at your interest cost over time and uh, I usually use a, a rule of thumb. It's not really accurate, but it seems to work. 
uh, that when you go out for a bond for a million dollars, you're going to spend two million dollars over, over the life of the bond paying off the debt and paying the interest on the debt. See, that's the money that we could have been using for our infrastructure under this new pl plan that we have. We won't be Precisely. having those associated costs with it then. Precisely. So. If we can just get a step outside of that premise, I'll bet you that will increase into the future. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of my goal is let's, let's change our focus a little bit. We may have to delay for a certain amount of time in order to generate the money that we need right. for today's projects. But if we don't have to pay the banker for them, that's not a bad thing. That's going to put some real dollars forward for you. Because if you look at it, as you were saying before, if we went to the route we're going right now, it's every seven years we're going out there. You figure over 30, 40 years, uh, how many millions of dollars that we've just actually let go. With this plan we have now that we're coming up with, our plan that we're having today, is that we're going to be eliminating all that extra cost and that we'll be able to move forward and invest it back into our infrastructure and, and, and our roads and everything else that we have going on. So I thank you very much for your hard work and, and trying to get the word out there to let people know that we're thinking about a long-term investment and making sure that we get our money here instead of having to pass it on to someone else before we even get it back to us again. So. We need to maintain what we need here. Thank you, Jim. I think I'd sum it up. I'll try. But paying $2 million to do $1 million worth of work makes my stomach turn. Yes. And I'm very glad that we are headed in a new direction. I think those choices needed to be made at that time frame. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to give any kind of indication that there was anything wrong with the decisions made to this point. We worked with what we had, but we might have an opportunity here that uh, could really benefit the city much longer than just a, a year or two, and that's what I'm really hoping for. Yeah, because it was, it was pay as you go. And then it, you know, the, the, the costs became so astronomical that there was no way you could do that because if you were going to, you know, save until you had it, you were never going to get it done. And so, I think when those decisions were made, there wasn't really much. There wasn't really much choice. I but now we've come to the point where where we can make these kind of decisions because of decisions we've made in the past. I think we were walking into the woods, not knowing where the woods were, what the woods were, and how they how it was going to affect us. I think now, though. Well, I think in 2004, when we did the analysis, the uh, engineering study, which told us we had $38 million of things <laughs> that need to be done. Oh, by the way, that's just a high priority number. I mean, it was a lot larger if you included the medium and low priority numbers. But in 2004, we saw what we had to face. We started looking at it. We came forward with uh, requests for millage. <coughs> the first time it didn't, pat, it didn't go through, the second time it did, the third time it did, at the same time we started seeing the water and sewer problems and how much that needed to be looked at and we saw long term, we, we saw 20 years of, or more of time frames where we didn't sock away cash or utilize the cash for capital for water and sewer. So I think we've changed the pattern now and I think we are re getting real close to the springboard to be able to help the city for a long term, a long time in the future. Yep. Absolutely. No, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, we will move on. Good report. We're uh, on to the consent agenda. Linda, if you want to read that. To approve the regular council work session and executive session minutes of November 19th, 2018. Approve the bills memo in the amount of $428,283.35. Approve a special assessment agreement for the on bill finance project for installation of a new sewer and water line at 1119 Fulton Avenue and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the necessary documents. Approve the acceptance of a $15,000 HUD housing counseling grant for neighborhood housing services and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the necessary documents. Adopt a proposed diversity and inclusion statement. 
approve an amendment to the City of Grand Haven personnel policy to provide for a discretionary annual compensation for positive budget performance. Approve the 2019 Winterfest to take place in the Harborfront parking lot on January 25th and 26th. Waive fees in the amount of $1,517. Permit the consumption of alcohol and allow amplified sound until 11 o'clock p.m. And support the submission of a coastal grant application for the Grand Haven Lighthouse Planning Project and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the necessary documents. All right, is there a motion? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Comments or questions on any of these items on our consent agenda? I noticed some of the Human Relations Commission folk here, and I want to thank you on, I'm going to say, threading a very fine needle with the choice of words as far as the inclusion statement goes. Well done. Anything else? If not, we are ready to vote. Fritz? Yes. Manessa? Yes. Brueger? Yes. Michaela? Yes. All right. And on to new business. First item is to accept the proposal from <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Kevin Marsh in the amount of $24,530 to provide preliminary final design and construction engineering services for street resurfacing 2019 and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the necessary documents. The administration recommends approval. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. It's been moved and seconded. And Derek is right here. <laughs> All right, Derek Gates, Public Works Director. Yes, uh, so we're going to um, do some resurfacing uh, in the spring of 19. And um, this is just the engineering fees that uh, is accustomed with a project like this. Um, and uh, we're going to include Gidley um, or Waverly at Gidley Bayou because we couldn't get it done this fall. Um, the asphalt pavers were busy. Um, or sitting at home, uh, one of the two. So. <laughs> Hunting, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, we're we're gonna uh, engineering services for that. One big change: um, the first two years since I've been here, we've we've resurfaced roads, and Ed Abin Marsh has been doing the inspections. Um, when I first got here, there had been some training already to train the city uh, personnel to inspect uh, uh, the resurfacing pro uh, uh, projects, and um, we did some additional training, um, and then last year. <coughs> Uh, or the, actually the, the fall of the, the last year, we sent our personnel out with the Abenar Marsh inspector uh, to do some on-the-job training. So this year, this engineering service has included um, uh, no construction inspection, but construction services. So they'll consider, con continue to um, compile all the numbers and make recommendations for, for uh, payment applications, um, but we'll do the actual on-site inspection full-time. Okay. Awesome. And these are the list of streets. Those are the list of streets. All right. I think we talked about those not too long ago, right? Yeah. Okay. Long discussion. Yep. And Derek, what's the total cost on the, our total budget that we're working with for those streets resurfacing next year? Uh, 450,000 total. Yeah. Plus we plus. added um, Waverly, which we had it budgeted at 145, however, the, um, the option that we chose to go with um, was an additional 55. So right. we're at 505 total. Okay, I remember it being right around 500, so that, yep, thank you. We will open this door to our average pressure reading. <laughs> <laughs> will it move it at all? We're moving up. Instead of 500,000, we're at 505. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we took it up a notch. Yeah, a, a, <laughs> not, a notch. A notch, point <laughs> zero, zero, one. So your, so your in-house inspection, this would be quality assurance and acceptance so that you willing to pay the bills or is it going to be more like staking or preparing the uh, for the pay pavement or is it just gonna be after the fact inspection no it's actually during the payment process okay so it'll be the milling um, they'll give direction on you know if we find a, an area that uh, if they milled out an inch and a half and it turns out we hit gravel at inch and a half um, you know to instruct them to to place uh, some additional asphalt there before putting the, the resurfacing layer on well, if we hit gravel at an inch and a half, then that road was ready to be rebuilt. <laughs> yes. Well, I won't tell you how many times we run into that then. <laughs> we run into that quite a few times. It's not uncommon. No, it is. However, but they do need that direction. The pavers need that direction with that on-site inspection to say, hey, 
a lot of times they'll just pave right over that. I had an inch and a half, they just continue to pave up, um, pave over it. So that's where our quantities when it comes to paving um, sometimes can differ. Um, so absolutely. Okay. Derek, did you happen to um, acquire a bid as well uh, that would include the inspection? Um, and or could you give us a ballpark of what we are saving by doing that portion in-house? I could give you a swag at that, probably in the neighborhood of five to 10 grand. Um, on a $450,000 job, I, I was budgeting um, heavily at 50. So we're, we're at 450,000 still, we're still doing the same amount. Um, heavily at 50, maybe 45, we come in at 24. So I think Evan Marsh sharpened their pencils on this. And, and, and you, so you're roughly five to 10 per project? Yeah, okay. total for tests are, eh, Five to eight, maybe or so, okay. um, you know, for resurfacing. But okay. Well, I think it's a good thing that our own folks are being are you know trained to do this, and uh, more talent within our own house. So I think that's a that's a real value. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, they get a little pride in their in their work too. They get yeah. to look over and make sure the inspection is correct, and they. They take a little ownership of it also, so this is really good. Yes, Pat. Just to credit where credit's due, you've got Matt and, and Todd and Colin and who else are? I think um, we also had... Uh, um, Sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, I know. Um, I got the low-hanging fruit. You did. <laughs> <laughs> did. Probably one of those three, but... but um, that, I mean, to have that, that uh, redundancy and layering of at least three people right now, I think a couple more that have been. Yeah, I think there's five total. Uh, observing um, directly and are able to know what to do and how to do it. And we were, we, we were missing that capacity three years ago when we had the um, concerns that we had up in the sand dunes. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, we were just there taking tickets. Um, nothing against the staff then. They were doing what they were trained and asked to do. Uh, so now Derek's brought that level up and done the training and it's a lot of work to go through all that training too so give those guys a good pat on the back for stepping up and wanting to do it too so because I like I said I went down and took a few courses myself and it's not I paint cars for a living so in order to know about roads it's totally different it's and what they had to go through and the basic training and to you know, level they have to be at to be certified is good. Tough vacation schedules. We'll give you a call, Mike. And yeah, you never know. <laughs> Lawn chair with a nice tea. Uh, well, I'd like to give credit where credit's due. Uh, Bill Hunter started that training before I got here. Actually, the first training was that fall of, of 16 before I got here. So we continued that and uh, we had a little, little laps and paving. So another one more training and on the job and said, okay, are we ready? They said, yes. So that's why I didn't uh, get the other quote, but significant oh, amount yeah. of money in savings. Well, good deal. Good deal and more knowledge amongst our own folks. We just, because I know it's got to be tough with these paver people. <laughs> got to do just more than just take a ticket, right? They're, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that crew's a different crew. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. I think we're ready to vote. Unless somebody else, I don't mean to cut anybody off, because anybody else had a comment, so. Nope. <laughs> All right. Vanessa? Yes. Kruger? Yes. Fritz? Yes. Michaela? Yes. Next item. Next item is to approve the retention by the Board of Light and Power of Varnum as special counsel pursuant to section 7.6G of the city charter to address various matters relating to electric utility operations. The administration recommends <coughs> approval. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Pat, you want to explain why we're uh, authorizing or going to vote on authorizing this? Yes, your, uh, the city charter provides that the city council is responsible for appointing the city attorney. And it specifically goes on to say that the city council may retain special legal counsel uh, to handle any uh, matter, you know, th which the city has an interest to assist the city attorney. Um, the firm of Varnum, uh, Dale Reitberg, sent a letter to our attorney saying that uh, he's been assisting the BLP, which is the city department in uh, legal matters. Uh, so formally, uh, in order to make that uh, reality, I guess the city council needs to act and, and appoint that attorney 
uh, as a special assistant city attorney to the city attorney that already works for the city. Uh, it's been done in the past. Uh, for some reason, I, <laughs> I went back and searched and uh, uh, found a couple of occasions in the 1993 uh, when the city council voted to appoint special counsel for the BLP. Um, I don't believe you've done that since 2003, since I've gotten here. I don't recall them asking for permission to hire particular attorneys. Uh, so I just thought it was a good timing to affirm that direction and, and make it formal. And uh, in case there were any question, it could end up, you know, sometimes these legal things can hinge on a technicality and I'd hate to have some good advice and some good process and good direction stymied because the proper appointment wasn't made. So I just thought it was a good idea for the record to request that you appoint Barnum to serve as a special city attorney. And they would be doing uh, legal services for uh, electric utility matters only, and uh, that needs to be more specialized in what our attorney can handle. Correct? Is correct. That, is that Somebody what? Is that what? Specifically, the, yeah, exactly. And that's what it's all about. Yes, and and our attorney, I've talked to him, and he's got no concerns or, or reservations whatsoever. That's why I took it as well that the uh, function of Arnhem was to assist with the operation of an electric business which is a little different than what we view when we talk about the city attorney representing the city in various legal matters. So I see no conflict here. Uh, I assume that this is at the request of the BLP board. Well, not directly. They didn't exactly ask. We just got this letter, which I've included a copy of in your uh, packet that sort of informing our city attorney that the uh, firm of Barnum serves in this capacity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I looked it up and thought, you know, it's not perfectly clear. If you if you read the approvals back in the 93, uh, it certainly doesn't suggest that they will just be working on a continuing basis. Uh, tonight's resolution, I think, assumes that, that they would be addressing various matters relating to electric utility operations, sort of more of a blanket approval. And I don't see this as being a lot different from any other consultant they might hire to assist them with operating an electric utility. I don't see it as competition with the city attorney's function. And any fees incurred are come out of BLP budget, not paid by uh, paid by ratepayers. Right. Yeah, hmm. but it doesn't come out of the city budget. No. Um, one question for you, Pat, on process, uh, and I understand the letters that were floating around. Um, has there been any resistance from the Board of Light and Power trustees? To Varnum, are they in favor of them? Do we have a straw poll? I'm, I'm taking Bob's question and going a little bit further with it. I, I have no indication right. that there's any kind of resistance. I, I think all indications are that they're very happy using Varnum and pleased with the services and would like to continue using them. And we're just sort of covering this as a formality to make sure that there's no holes in the mm -hmm. process. You know, that that my my real concern would be that uh, some. Uh, future uh, contract or negotiation or litigation or something be put at risk because we didn't actually take the proper step to make this attorney working for the city. You know, it's better to, to do it according. And when I went back and saw those motions from 1993, I thought, well, this is the way we used to do it. It's probably the right thing to do to make it clear that the city is responsible. Now, other consultants, if they hire engineers or others, we've, we've uh, had the city attorney opine on that, that they ought to get those contracts approved by city council as well. Um, and I, I don't see a problem with that. And I've asked that that be done. If they're going to enter into contracts, send them over in a list format uh, for, for periodic review and approval by the city council. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. I think um, if we're just, uh, what's the word in the planning area, codifying what is already being done and adding a little substance to it, I think that's perfectly fine. <coughs> and if the trustees would like somebody other than Barnum as their special counselor in the future, I'd encourage them to let us know. But this is the attorney, this is the, the attorneys that they have been using yeah. in the past, so, yeah. it's, so right. we're not, I mean, I... We're not putting anybody new with them. Right. I don't think we're requiring them to use Barnum or giving them the opportunity. Right. Uh, so. Sounds good. All right. I think we're ready to vote. Ruger? Yes. Frick? Yes. Nessa? Yes. And Caleb? Yes. Next item. <clears throat>
next item is to appoint the firm of Dickinson Wright as city attorney pursuant to section 7.2 of the city charter. The administration recommends approval. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. So Pat, no, so we've used Dickinson Wright for some time. Yeah, the, we, Scott Smith was the city attorney for 22 years uh, and had gone from uh, Cleary Nance to Law Weathers to Clark Hill and then Dickinson Wright. Each time he moved, we would go with him and Scott continued to be the city attorney, just working with a different firm. When Scott left this last summer, we just continued to use Dickinson Wright as our city attorney. Uh, I thought it was a good idea to formalize that and name the law firm of Dickinson Wright as the city attorney for the same reasons that, you know, formally we wouldn't want anybody to question whether or not Dickinson Wright was properly uh, appointed to serve as the city attorney. So it may be Ron Bolchi. Other professionals there include um, Jessica Woods and Emily Reisberg and Roger Sweats. Uh, some of those names may be familiar to you. Um, and, you know, again, I, I, we're, we've been very happy. Ron Bolchi has been very responsive, very immediate. Uh, after hours, during regular hours, you know, so far we've had very good results. Uh, costs are, are reasonable and uh, no risk because anytime you decide you want to go a different route, you can. And in one simple majority resolution, you can do other things. So this is just a good formality, a good um, codifying what you're already doing. <laughs> Bonus points for that one, Pat. Hmm. Oh, one of the concerns that I had had, it's been, a, it's been addressed, but I just wanted to uh, speak it was that, you know, when we had uh, Dickinson Wright and our, our, and Scott Smith as our attorney, our neighboring communities had a different attorney. And I always like to keep it that way because, you know, you want to, having the same attorney represent all these different, all these surrounding communities seemed like a potential, you know, you want to make sure your interests are well represented. And so, um, so this was a concern that I had as far as this is concerned, because now it's what four of our neighboring communities, including ourselves, have the same attorney. But if there are a conflict arises between us, between us as neighbors, we have the opportunity, or even through this, the firm to say, you have all have separate uh, representation, correct? Correct, if, if there were a conflict, this firm would not and could not represent any of us they would ask that we get that everybody gets separate counsel because right, that would be conflictual because they're representing all of us if there were negotiations going on they could offer their services but we could direct them any way that you wanted to you know if we we're uh, say we're negotiating a contract we might say well we're happy that one of our neighbors is working with this firm we're going to approach say a, a local firm or something to get some advice on this particular thing because we just want a, a second opinion to make sure that the city's interests are covered and I, and I, I really do, I think there's a lot of trust in a relationship with your legal counsel, and I do think they would advise us if they ever felt that our best interests weren't being served by their representation. So I'm, I'm very comfortable moving forward with them, but it is definitely a city council direction here. Okay. Well, these are highly professional people. I don't think they're going to compromise their professional standards over uh, differences between clients. They can't. Uh, and in the past, we've followed one attorney from firm to firm, and if we really were concerned about having the exclusive attention of a single attorney, we'd just simply hire a city attorney. I mean, Scott Smith ended up at Granville as their attorney. He doesn't work for Dickinson Wright or any other firm now. We could take that approach, but we've gotten away from that and just hired attorneys from other, other companies and then got comfortable with one and followed him from company to company. And whether we do that with Ron or someone else or decide that we want to go a different direction. Yeah, we can do that. You say it's no risk, but you do have some risk when you get a long-standing relationship with an attorney and he knows our people and our business and all the ins and outs and the history of things we've done. So it's not entirely no risk, but it's more, it could be undone. And maybe if we think that uh, there's better representation or more cost-effective representation, we could entertain that. But at this point in time, I'd say that our relationship with our city attorney is both professional and to some degree personal and that not terribly worried about them compromising standards or overextending themselves. 
And the other people at Dickinson Wright, I've been pretty happy with. We've had some very good uh, outcomes with some of the other attorneys. They do, they do seem to move around quite a bit. No, I have no problem with this resolution. I just take a little bit of uh, caution with the statement that there is a no risk proposition out there. I think my um, only hesitation in voting for this, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do just yet, um, is traditionally with any other, uh, and not any other, but with a majority of large dollar amount, large projects, any project over a certain dollar amount in the city, um, we put together an RFP and we ask for firms to compete. And I think that is a part of us getting the best bang for our buck. Um, not that Dickinson Wright is anything wrong, they've done a marvelous job. Um, really like them in my interaction with them and would echo the professionalism. But I think as we spend taxpayer dollars um, for legal services, uh, it's incumbent upon us to make sure we're getting the biggest bang for the buck for our citizens. And without a compare and contrast, um, I can't see that. Um, I see that Dickinson Wright does a great job, and I don't think we'll do wrong if they end up being appointed tonight and continue to. Um, but I suppose I'd feel better if there was some sort of time horizon on this, uh, and then we'd renew the contract. I don't like it having to be initiated by a complaint or a frustration from council, because um, this is, unless there is a complaint or a frustration, this is a kind of a in perpetuity uh, appointment of them. And that's a little bit of an extreme, but yeah, I'd feel much more comfortable for a shorter term than if we had had uh, some sort of uh, presentation from a few other options out there. So that's my thought right now. Well, I've been dealing with them for quite a while now. We've had Roger Sweats do a lot of work for us, and <clears throat> they're a very competent firm. Um, I know that we followed Scott all the way through because of the Grand Landing and everything else and all the information there. And working with Roger and all the other ones that are there, they're very capable of doing watching over the Grand Landing right now. So I'm willing to stick with them for a little longer. The only for the simple fact is that they have a lot of history there to go back for us and making sure that everything is followed accordingly. And uh, I have a lot of faith in them. So I'm going to support Dickinson Wright myself personally. Okay. No, and I, there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. They, you know, that all the, the legal battles that we have gone through over with certain things, it's, you like to have continuity there. Uh, and I think that that's really important. You don't want to start somebody from scratch, uh, you know, in some of these things that we're, that we've dealt with over the years. So continuity in, in those areas is a good idea. So. It's, you know, just a, a point to following up on Josh's comment, the um, unanimity is always important. It, I know it is the professionals. You know, when, when I took this job, it was nice to have a, a 5 0 vote. Um, and at any time, you know, the, the clerk, the manager, and the attorney are appointed and serve at the will of city council. Uh, so if you want to you know, price shop a little bit or look around, you know, we could do that. It would just be a good idea tonight to get this firm on board firmly. And then if city council at some future date says, let's go out and see what the pricing's like, or I could give you a report on that, and we could look at what we pay and what our neighbors pay and do some comparisons and see if you want to go out and see if there's a more economical uh, way to, to get legal services. Mm -hmm. You have to remember, Pat, sometimes the cheaper route is not necessarily the best route. No, and I'm not necessarily I'm just, you know, Josh, I'm just going by the oh, past, past history, what we've had with them, then making sure that we we're still not over the hump with Grand Landing, we're still not over the hump with a few other things, right. and n knowing what they've done for us and being in the, in the mix of it, to go to someone else right now at this time would be very difficult for me to handle. And I, and I think toward that, that end, if we were to put a three-year or five-year time horizon on this, I'd be voting in favor of it. But absent yeah. that, I'd it doesn't hurt to look, you know. But right now, at this time period, I just I don't. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Any other comments? If not, we will vote. Chris. Yes. Vanessa. Yes. Bruder. No. Nope. Michaela. Yes. Next item. Next item. 
is to approve the proposal from Getter Cut to remove one tree and trim 21 trees at a not to exceed cost of $17,600, allow staff an additional $2,400 in funding to rim or remove other trees identified during the winter trimming season, and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the necessary documents. The airport board and the administration recommend approval. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, one thing I'm really glad to see in here is a buffer. <laughs> I still have so the shoulder on that one, me too. <laughs> yeah, just so we're not, because we always know it isn't going to be exactly what it is. So, But I don't know, Pat, if you wanted to say any more. <laughs> Liam, <laughs> okay. I, I want to second the mayor's comments verbally and say I appreciate the buffer too. I think that's, I think that's wise. <laughs> Yeah, the unfortunate part is that the trees that aren't removed will continue to grow and we'll be doing it again. Yep. But also looked at the cost of complete removal and that was significantly more. We removed quite a few trees from some pe uh, personal property on people at one time and it did cost us a lot to do that, but we had some funding to help us, but it's difficult to round up when it comes out of our pocket. Well, yeah, there is no help on this one. That's what I'm saying. And the, and the costs are 10 times greater to remove compared to these pruning costs. So I think we're kind of stuck on this one. Yeah. But Gitter Cut's a good company. I've used them where I work. And yeah. we've used Gitter them for city done. projects, and they're local. All right. I think we're ready to vote. Vanessa? Yes. Kruger? Yes. Fritz? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, item F. Item is to approve a revised license agreement with Nipoti Nipoti to use the city-owned parking lot on Harbor Drive to serve the Notos at the Bill Maher restaurant and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the necessary documents. The administration recommends approval. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. And Pat, do you want to explain what the couple minor changes here? Uh, well, it had to do with some financing that the uh, new business was working on and their <coughs> typical due diligence, I think, during the process. Uh, an attorney for uh, a lender looked at it and said, you know, if this is your primary parking lot, we're not comfortable with the termination at will language. So there's language in there that said the city can just terminate it anytime for no cause or any cause. And they didn't like that. And I looked at it and uh, thought it through and thought, practically speaking, uh, you know, we were just through an experience with the previous owner for decades, um, which were an interesting number of decades. And, and the city council, not a one city council member ever even suggested that we would think about terminating it for no cause. You know, it, it, it's a business that really needs that room for parking during the peak summer months. During the off months, there's no need for, you know, nobody wants to use it anyways. It'll just be used as a parking lot for that restaurant. But during those peak months, they do need it. And uh, so I did not see, I won't say there was no risk, but little risk uh, in removing that and saying that the city may revoke if the license has been breached. But if they don't breach the license, they get to continue to use it. It sounded reasonable to me. So I, I made the changes. Our attorney looked at it. Their bank's attorney looked at it. Everybody said it was okay. Uh, uh, they've already signed it, uh, and it's ready for your approval if you should choose to do so. Okay. And it is a license, so it just needs the approval tonight. Okay. Well, I, I thought these were reasonable points, reasonable points for their finance sort of to bring up and not significant changes. And like I said, it's not something that we would do anyway without, without cause. So I don't have any problem with this. I think it's a good idea. I think making changes for cause is fair, whereas making changes arbitrarily without reason is unreasonable and shouldn't be done. Right. And I don't know how you can plan on running a business if you don't know where you're going to be parking next year. <laughs> Nobody's going to invest in that. So I, I welcome the investment that the um, appreciate what Notice is doing out there. I think that this is a it's a proper change. Any other comments? Nope. Not. We will vote. Kruger? Yes. Fritz? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Michaela? Yes. 
And our unfinished business item. This is to approve a final resolu resolution <coughs> rezoning 1505 Grant Avenue from moderate density residential to Beech Tree Zoning District. The Planning Commission and the Administration recommend approval. I need a motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded, and this is the second reading on this. So anybody have any questions or comments? Anything, anything changed since two weeks ago? Nothing. Okay. I was pretty happy then. All right. All good. <laughs> then we're ready to vote. Chris? Yes. Manette? Yes. Kruger? Yeah. Michaela? Yes. All right. Report by City Council. Who wants to start? Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Santa Claus has arrived. Absolutely. <laughs> what a night. Along with his lovely the, the, bride. The Jingle Bell Parade. Yes. Luckily, it was a light sprinkle, not a torrential downpour as it was slightly afterwards. So That's right. Um, I want to commend everybody that was came out there and stood out in the rain and, or the sprinkle I mean, rain, whatever you want to call it, the wetness. And uh, it was still a pretty decent crowd. I, I've seen more when we've had 60 and 70 degree weather out there. I've seen a whole lot more, but it was very good. And it's nice to see the people out there and it's a good way to start the season off. And um, I gotta say thank you for everybody that participated and all the people that came. Merry Christmas. Absolutely. Nothing to report. Okay. Well, I enjoyed the parade as well as I could, getting cold and wet. But appreciate everybody who was also standing out there being cold and wet. It's an all-weather event. What do you expect? This is Michigan, <laughs> so we're tough here. And I was going to talk a little bit about the uh, Windsor Dick Policy Committee meeting and the resolution and such. But we covered that during work session, so don't really need to talk a lot more about that. I do enjoy going to those meetings and seeing the issues faced by in Muskegon County and communities to the north and their willingness to work with us and our willingness to work with them. So it's one of those regional collaboration things that's kind of forced on us by the feds because it's part of their financing structure, but it's still good, good, good neighborly relationships. And that's all I got. All right. Yeah, I, uh, it was, I thought the parade was, uh, I was, I was quite impressed. I was quite impressed with the number of people that came out in rather inclement weather, and uh, but a, and uh, a good time was had by all, and uh, the rain held off until Santa and Mrs. Claus uh, descended from their carriage, and uh, and wished the crowd a a merry Christmas. So, uh, thanks to Pat for putting a canopy up for Santa and Mrs. Santa to stand under to to greet the kids and uh, and we, we're just good at improvising. Uh, it, you know, our public works guys, you know, put all this stuff up, uh, BLP for uh, decorating the fountain and the chamber for putting together such a nice parade. Uh, it's a fun kickoff to our uh, Christmas season. And uh, the way we, you know, now, you know, Santa is officially here and the uh, and Christmas season can begin. So we're off, we're off to a great start. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, all we need now is some more snow to come after. And Dan looks like we walked away from that, and the rain came down, and uh, so it was great timing. Uh, good time was had by all. So uh, on to city manager's report. Uh, very briefly, I just wanted to uh, thank all of you for ringing the bell on Friday. We managed to, we haven't gotten the total yet. I'll report that when we find out. But I think it was pretty uh, good this year, even though it's, it's uh, as you all probably noticed, everybody uses cards. Not a lot of people walk around with much cash, but I think they were getting cash back or something because they were putting money in when they came out of the stores. Uh, so I, I appreciate all of you, all of our elected officials, even though you're volunteers, you volunteer in other ways too, such as ringing the Salvation Army bell, and that's sort of fun. Um, I wanted to thank the finance <coughs> department. The uh, uh, employees there were really critical in helping put together the Jingle Bell Party before the parade, uh, as well as Sherry at uh, DPW, and uh, Santa Claus himself was here. Um, and the DPW helped get everything set up, and it was just a neat party, uh, and I'm grateful for that and the extra effort that many employees put in on their own time, you know, going, coming in and making sure that a lot of little kids there uh, were 
beaming as you saw in the parade you know that they're just all about that sort of thing so that, that was really fun thank you very much and that is all i had to, oh oh no no, no, the, no. Wait, oh wait i have to with the the elves ashley and and the, whoever get i think ashley gathered the elves big thing to you. hand out they 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 always look so amazing and uh, they make our our walk through the uh, parade so much easier we can stay together and they're blessing the kids with wonderful chocolate. So thanks, Ashley and the elves for doing such a great job. Almost forgot. And, and all the kids, we did a survey. Um, they said the number two thing they liked the most about the parade was the candy. And number one was seeing city council walk through the parade. Where'd you find these kids? Where'd you find these kids? Is Pat going to be able to walk out the door tonight? Look at him, huh? <laughs> The, the last thing I have is I gave oh, you yeah. a, a brief ballot for you to look at on the goals. I tried my best to, to capture the things that you talked about last Monday. Uh, if you feel I missed anything, by all means, let me know. Uh, if I don't hear something, that'll be the first time. Uh, so I'm looking forward to getting some future uh, direction from you guys. And hopefully by our next meeting so I can get something on the next agenda for you to vote on. Um, but I think it's pretty straightforward. We had a good chat, a couple, three hours last Monday night uh, spent hammer away at some of the things you want to see happen in Grand Haven. That's, that's what makes the budgeting. After we get that done, I give that to all the department heads, and as they begin to work on their budget, they keep your direction in mind, and that's why the budget process goes more smoothly because you see things that you expect to see in the budget. So thank you very much for last Monday night, and uh, the sooner you can get that back to me, the, the more likely I'll be able to get it back to you. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, general business call the audience. One opportunity, one more opportunity to say what's ever on your mind. Thanks for sitting through the meeting. Enjoyed watching your smiling face back there, and, uh, and all of you back there. So uh, at that, it, it, we will now uh, adjourn. Smile more than others. Say what? Let's smile more than others. Oh, absolutely. <laughs>